Welcome to the Daily Update. This is being prepared Thursday, September 22nd, where we'll look at the action in the market today and then see how things look for Friday, September 23rd. And I was kind of hoping not to do a full-blown video today, but we had a, enough of a decline. Our charts are really starting to change. In fact, we're getting into a pretty significant oversold condition. Now, that doesn't mean we have to stop here. We can still go lower. Just because we become overbought or oversold, that doesn't mean everything's just going to turn and go the other way. But it might mean, and typically means, that things will slow down and will build some kind of a base, or we could actually see some kind of a bounce back up because we're seeing some convergence of different indicators coming together. But we just want to be aware of this. So if you're looking at going short, if you're look at, looking at the market continuing to fall, I just want to throw those warning signs out to you. If you're looking to go long, it's really kind of premature for that because we're not getting any confirmation on our charts right now. So I went ahead and just thought, well, we're seeing a lot of changes in the charts. Let's go ahead and do a full-blown video and then let you make the determination of how this can help you. So let's go back and talk about what happened. We did have a gap lower open with prices eventually falling down to S1 at 37.51. As the day went on, we stayed above S1. So that became a support level. Going into the close, it looked a lot better. Buying took prices almost back up to the unchanged level. And going into the last 15 minutes or so, the market was looking like it was really improving. But the last 10 minutes, there was some kind of a sell program or just a lot of selling taking place within the last 10 minutes. And that kicked us down and made us a lot more negative than we would have been had we closed almost at the level that we recovered to. We ended up being down 0.84%. Volume was still above average. So we're seeing that continue a little bit above average these days. The technicals, they're negative and oversold. And I'll go through that. The fixation continues to be inflation and interest rates, which is producing a lot of growth concerns. We have some geopolitical concerns just to be aware of, but the markets are really fixated on the inflation and interest rates. Earnings are it's kind of slow right now, but they're coming out on a company by company basis. Not really much of the re recession debate. I mean, people know that they're having difficult times right now. You don't need to define it by anything necessarily in that regard. People can see what's going on. And then we might have some additional Fed speak that could make its way out into the media. So let's talk about some comments. We're seeing interest rates really going up. Higher interest rates are causing a lot of headwinds for stocks. And when we get to our correlation charts, you'll see that stocks are going up, interest rates are going down. Well, now what we're seeing is interest rates are going up and stocks are going down. And then a lot of the other central banks around the world, they ended up raising interest rates as well. So on Thursday, the Bank of England, they raised half a percent and they're at two and a quarter. The Norges Bank, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but that's in Norway, they raised their rate 50 basis points to two and a quarter. The Bank of Indonesia raised it half a percent up to four and a quarter. Hong Kong, they raised it by 75 basis points or three quarters of a percent to three and a half. And Swiss, the Swiss Bank in Switzerland, they raised theirs by three quarters of a percent to 0.5. Get that. They had negative interest rates. So this is the first time since 2015 that Switzerland, you know, that they're known for banking and secrecy and all those things. This is the first time in pretty much seven years that they've had positive interest rates as far as when you go to borrow money. The Bank of Japan, that's a different story. OK, and I've, I've alluded to that in some earlier videos. I'm keeping an eye on that situation, but there are some things going on in Japan that make it a little bit different than what's going on everywhere else. And that could eventually bleed over into the U.S., specifically with interest rates. They kept their rates unchanged, and they're still negative at 0.1%. And they also came out and said, we're probably not going to raise those anytime in the near future. So just get set for that 
to continue with negative interest rates. They're really starting, trying to spark some economic growth, some economic activity. And if that really picks up and inflation becomes a real problem there and growth becomes a lot stronger, that might have some impact on the bonds that they own. And outside of the US, Japan owns more treasury bonds than any other entity. And if they start running into trouble, they're probably going to have to start selling those bonds. And when they sell it, that means the price goes down and that pushes interest rates in the U.S. up even more. So we're just trying to keep an eye on what's happening there. Transports continue to decline, setting another 52-week low. And I'm saying that on a short-term basis, very much so, but even more in the intermediate term, we're becoming oversold. We still have the same yield curves inverted that have been inverted, the 30 to the 5, the 10 to the 2, the 10 to the 5. Sentiment, it's dropping down a little bit. We're not in the extreme fear tank yet, but it is becoming more fearful in the market. We had jobless claims come out, and this is kind of the trend that we're seeing. There were fewer jobless claims than what they had expected. And this is pointing more to the strong employment situation and why some people are saying, we're not in a recession, look at employment, even though everything else is looking very recessionary. We had the second quarter current account deficit actually improved, if you can consider $251.5 billion and an improvement, they expected it to be down more than that, but we know that we have a real deficit in the US. So it, it's not necessarily new information there. The leading economic index, it decreased. This tries to look out into the future and say, what is the economy going to be like going forward into the future? And it declined 0.3% on a month over month basis. So that's suggesting weakness in the future as well. We still have a negative trend because we're slightly above 20. Our bias continues to be down or negative because of the down day. And our momentum is also negative since we've seen a lot of down days in a row. Let's go back and talk about the session. See, we're down in the 31 area and they must change this. I, I only look at this end of day. So they must update this at certain times because we were at something like 37 yesterday and now they have the previous close was at 28. Eh, it's not what I was getting here. So, and then you can see the date at the bottom. It's actually dated a day later. So I don't know. What do you get for free sometimes? But we're, we're getting down into the lower end of the fear range. And we could start to get into the extreme fear. This might actually be short-term painful, longer-term helpful because we're seeing an oversold condition. Some of our indicators are, are getting pretty extreme negative. And if we can get fear down there as well, sentiment, that might really help things. That might produce some kind of a significant bounce. We'll have to see. We've been in this situation numerous times in 2022, and we saw some nice bounces only to have them fizzle out pretty quickly. And here's the historical chart. We're seeing a bit of a spike up in our right X bear bull ratio. Even though this is a little bit lagging, this is the 21st when we read, took this reading here. But fear is starting to speak, really kick up here. But it's not necessarily extreme, but it could be extreme. We've come to this point before and then turned around and went the other way. So it's just showing that there's more fear starting to increase with the Ridex mutual fund investors. We did get the weekly survey and yet again, individual investors are extremely pessimistic right now, but we've been down here before and we tend to use this as a contrary indicator when they show excessive fear or excessive greed. And we've been bouncing around these lower levels for quite a while we get a bit of a bounce from that at times only to have it come back down. But this is just something that we can use from a sentiment standpoint to show that we're starting to get a little excessive with the fear. This is just trying to compare the midterm year that we're in right now, 2022, and that's the green line here and how it's been jockeying around with 1962, which is the gold line here, which 
showed that it was down a little bit, but then we saw some recuperation going into the end of the year, but it was still down overall. Where in 1982, we had a pretty rough beginning up to the midterms and then saw a really nice advance and actually went above zero and had ended the year positive for the S&P. We're just trying to figure out what's it going to be like. We don't know at this point. So this is just kind of interesting to look at. This is also showing sentiment is still leaning to the left, meaning that folks are more in the risk off type of investments and tending to favor those, where if they were more on a risk on basis, that would be more into stocks and riskier investments that give you a better return, but also go down more when we're having trouble. So we're still in a more risk off type of an environment. And that's what we've been seeing for pretty much all of 2022. Here's another thing, the truck tonnage, they're trying to make a comparison between big trucks and the economy. And I actually included the text from the chart here where it says that 72.5% of the US freight um, is represented by trucks and it can serve as a barometer. This chart shows that markets tend to increase in line with the physical size and expansion of the US economy. Well, we've been really coming down here with the S&P 500, and this has been ticking back up a little bit. And then they try to qualify this by saying this is not a leading indicator, but it's very interesting because it shows how the US stock market tends to follow the physical expansion and contraction of the US economy. Well, this is ticking back up a little bit. We're still pretty far from this purple line, but is the fact that this is going up slightly, is that gonna help stocks economically? Because they use trucks to ship things around and there's been a lot of supply chain issues, of course, inflation and all kinds of things that are really having problems right now. So the fact that this is actually turning up could be seen as somewhat positive. This just shows how the global oil demand growth has been. Where in 2020, that was during the lockdown. It really, somebody was driving anywhere. And then it really spiked up in 2021 and it's been trailing off in 2022. And they expect it to fall even further in 2023. And a lot of that has to do with legislation that's coming out as well as high prices. And we're back at the point now where you don't just jump in your car, run to the store, come back home, run to the post office, come back home go to the movie theater, come back home. It's like, no, first we go to the store, go to the post office. And then after that, we go to the movie and then we go home. So people are having to strategize their trips a little more. And that tends to use less gas when they're traveling around. This is also, we've been seeing a lot of different charts about corporate buybacks and the leading read on S&P 500 buybacks. They are declining overall where it's decreasing on a year over year basis. It's still positive. Companies are still buying their own stock back, but it is decreasing. And then this is the four week average. And this is kind of what I was showing in the chart that they had yesterday, where it's right around the zero line. Because when this is going up, that tends to give more support to the stock market. Okay. Then we see a sharp decline in global debt levels in terms when you compare it to the US dollar, or use that as the base security or base currency. But global, global debt to GDP ratios are on the rise again. This is just showing the global debt in US dollars. This is the whole globe. And I don't even know how to say it, it was at 360, 355 trillion dollars. Yeah, that's a pretty stinking lot of debt. I don't even know if we have that much money in existence. So this could portend to some future problems as well as debt goes up. Then here's another real estate or housing chart showing that previously owned houses. Again, in the chart that I showed yesterday, we have a tendency to spike up and then go down. And then sometimes there's a recession after that. Spike, go down, recession. Spike, go down, recession. Well, this is a whole COVID thing. Well, we have been declining with previously owned homes as well. So we're seeing pretty much across the board weakness in home sales. This also shows that small caps tend to be undervalued right now, where there's a the spread between the rolling eight week cumulative flows as a percent of market cap, small caps against large caps going back to 2008. 
And this is pretty much the same thing that I've been showing in some other charts where small caps are underperforming and are also considered undervalued. This could help support the market. Now, you can see other times when we got down to this green line, we actually went below that. So just because we're down here doesn't mean we're going to stop and go the other way. But when the market does look to start improving, that's when a lot of folks might get into some small cap stocks and that can give some support to the S&P. And this is the chart that I showed yesterday. Not sure why that one was still there. Thought I deleted it. We were down across the board again, not as much as what we saw on Wednesday, but still negative overall, especially the small caps. They're just getting hammered right now, where the large caps actually held up a little better. The mid caps, which had been giving us a glimmer of hope just a week or two ago, and now they're just kind of raining on our parade. This is also another interesting thing. We're, we had a down day. We were down 0.84% and the VIX declined on a closing basis, and the bar didn't really expand all that much. So that's kind of strange. We want to see this to get to some kind of capitulation point where the VIX can really spike up even higher. Now, it could pick a spike at any time, but if we go back to other times, when we saw fairly significant bottoms in the S&P, it's when the VIX was a lot higher than it is now. Here's the VIX of the VIX. Just It's pretty much going sideways as the volatility of the VIX has really been decreasing. The ulcer index continues to advance because we're having down days. This is more in line with the sentiment reading that we're getting. We're just watching this. This is the mass index. We want to wait to see if this line goes above the blue line, and it's kind of far away from that now. We're now down 22.01% from the all-time high. Equity put call ratio did spike up with the down day, and that's more to be expected. And our five day, it's starting to turn back up, which that's more to be expected with the weakness that we're seeing. Here are the pivot levels for Friday's session. And again, looking at the, well, I'm going to wait and do this on the intraday chart because we're seeing some early weakness and then late day strength that I've been pointing out recently. We did go below S1. That was after yesterday's session, and we continue to fall. We have S2 down here at about 37.07 to 37.08. So that's kind of interesting because we're at 37.57 right now. So another 50 point decline, 50 to 50 point, 50 to 51 point decline, and we could get down to this S1 level, and we see that volume is still slightly above average. Here are the pivot points for the entire month of September. And then here's a lot of the shorter term. If you watch these videos every day, I started off a few days ago and last week showing short-term Fibonacci levels. Well, we broke through those. So then I started to show intermediate-term Fibonacci levels. Well, we broke through those. So now I'm showing more long-term Fibonacci levels. And this goes from the COVID low to the all-time high also to a significant low in 2021 to the all-time high. And we are continuing to break down below what had been pretty significant support. Well, we broke through that below, but are we going to continue to go down and pretty much test the June lows here? There's also another long-term FIB chart. We had been staying above this 38.2% retracement. Well, we continue to be down below that. Here's another long-term FIB chart. We're coming down to another level, to a, that other low that was set in 2021 to the all-time high. Even though we broke down below it before, we were able to regain that. Well, we're coming back down to this level again with this FIB retracement. And I only have one of these charts today to show you. I, for some reason, two ended up. We're getting right to the midpoint here of this longer-term trend going all the way to 2008 into 2009. And this has acted, has pretty significant support in the past. Now, we could break below that, but if we don't stay there for very long, this support might hold, or we could be getting ready to go all the way to the other band. Looking at sectors, we had a down day led by discretionary, which had been holding up. They're starting to show some weakness now. Financials were down, industrials were down, materials, tech, all down over a percent. 
And the one area that was up is healthcare. The scooter scores still show that utilities and energy have the best looking charts and communication, even though it bumped up to the high reading of 7.2, it's still pretty bleak. Here are the sectors with energy and utilities positive. All of the other sectors have been negative since the all time high. Here's an update of the percentage changes with the indexes since the S&P made its all time high. Most of them were negative alerts. Uh, the S&P went below 30 with the BPI. I'll show you that chart. NASDAQ below 11.2, 11.1. I think that's it for right now on there. But a lot of sectors are seeing BPI crosses. We're, that's pretty much it. A uh, new 52-week low with real estate, communication 52-week low. Uh, the euro, four-year low against the dollar. Um, just a lot of BPIs crossing over. And bullish percent indexes are point and figure buy or sell signals. So when we see those decline, that means there are more sell signals being generated. Point and figure charts don't take into account time. They just look at price movement. And so if, if it moves 10 points, whether it takes a day or 10 months, the chart will still look the same. It's not counting time, just movement. The one high spot up here, the positive sign is that the dollar set another four year high. Our scores, now we have the Dow back in first place at 53.7, still a pretty bleak score. Mid caps, which had been doing better, they're declining. They're in second place at 46.2. The S&P's in third place at 42.2 with the small caps, declining pretty severely to 35.2. And the Qs, which have pretty much been holding up last place, they declined down to 17.5. Okay, this is what I want to talk about. Where last Friday we saw early weakness and then late day strength. And I pointed that out in the video. Monday, we saw early weakness and late day strength. We also on Tuesday, early weakness and late day strength, even though we didn't end up positive on that day. Then we had Wednesday with the Fed, and that's kind of a crazy day all by itself. Well, we did gap lower and we went sideways, even though we saw some real weakness coming in in the last 10 minutes, there was some late day strength going on. Just want to see if that's going to continue. This is telling us that the amateurs who are opening the market, they're selling, reacting, doing all the things that they do. But then it's the smart money that comes in later in the day, the last one to two hours and start to do what they want to do. We've been seeing kind of a pattern of that lately. Other than this last bar that took us down quite a bit, we want to see, is that going to continue in Friday's session? These are some clues that we can get when we watch things intraday. The ADX is above 20 and above the moving average with the red light on top. So we are in a negative trending environment, according to this reading. We're still looking pretty extreme with the Arun. When you take the sellers on the top and the buyers on the bottom, compare them and come up with an oscillator, can see other times when we've gone extreme negative, quite often that can mark some kind of a bottom in the S&P. Looking at breadth, we're starting to see a bit of a negative divergence here. We saw a decline based on price and volume, but I drew a line here. See how we haven't made a lower low based on price, but we are making a lower low based on volume, and that's a negative divergence. A lot of times volume tends to precede price, not always, but we just want to be aware of that. The advanced decline ratio is now starting to get extreme negative. New highs, new lows, we're seeing a real expansion of this. So we're seeing a turn down with our five and a continued decline with our 10. Accumulation distribution had been trying to hang in there, but it's back down to the moving average after showing some weakness. Short term, we're pretty much oversold. Going back five periods, we're, even though we ticked up slightly, we're still in extreme negative territory. Going back 10 periods, we're getting extreme negative. Stoke RSI, extreme negative. Williams percent R, extreme negative. Force index, getting pretty extreme. But eh, still more in just a decline, but not a real severe decline. The Swindland trading oscillator, declining and getting close based on price to getting extreme, still declining based on volume. McClellan oscillator, getting extreme negative. 
20 extreme negative, 50 extreme negative, 20 just ahead of being extreme negative. All of our stochastics are extreme negative. So this is where I'm getting the short term oversold condition. Now let's look at the intermediate term. We're starting to come down with our 19 day exponential moving average of the advanced decline line. This is now dropping into extreme negative territory and might generate some kind of a signal, both based on price and volume. So that's intermediate term. And this is a chart I haven't shown for a while. This is standard deviation. How far do we get away from what the normal price should be? When we get far away from that, price has a tendency to move back in that direction. We're getting kind of far away from this moving average now. Now we could still go higher and it goes higher before, but we're starting to get quite a bit of ways away from that. So we just, and that, that would potentially be positive since we have been going down. Rate of change going back 20 periods, extreme negative. Sean Trend Meter getting extreme negative. PMO, negative across the board. PMOs that are rising, extreme. Buy signals, extreme negative and declining with those that are above zero. The Sean, why do I say that? The Chaikin Oscillator is turning a lot more negative now, as is the Chaikin Money Flow, showing some weakness. Volume tapering off even though we're slightly above average. The vortex actually bounced up a little bit with the red line. We're flat with the green line, so it's still negative overall. Summation index based on price and volume continues to decline. The slopes finally starting to turn over and go back negative with all of our other oscillators negative. The BPI, this is when we cross down below 30, and that's pretty significant, and we're starting to get extreme with that. But again, it could go lower than where we're at right now. Ease of movement, flattening out to a little bit higher. Ultimate oscillator actually turned up slightly. Money flow index also turned up slightly. Kind of interesting how that works. We're seeing two indicators that are showing us the opposite of what's happening. Either these indicators are not right or they're seeing something that might help produce some kind of a bounce. The CCI 14, extreme negative, as is the CCI 20. RSI 9 is still extreme negative. We still have some more room to go down with the RSI 14. The boom indicator, that's just based on 50 periods, getting extreme negative. We're still declining with the 200-day moving average. And all this does is this measures where our current price is against these moving averages. When we get too far away from them, the moving averages tend to act like magnets or rubber bands and pull price back to it. And it just shows that we've been going down pretty far, pretty fast, according to this. Here is the Dow theory chart where we're not quite at a new low with the Dow, but we are making new lows with the transports. That's a negative divergence. Another thing, if you include utilities, is that even though utilities have been declining, they're not near making the low that was set earlier by the Dow and the trannies. TTM squeeze also is now kind of picking up some of this weakness that's been happening. Balance of power is turning back down. This is just a confirmation here that we're negative. We want to watch this black line to see if it goes down any further, because a lot of times this will mark some kind of an extreme reading. It could be right now, but it could also go down even more. The first signal was generated when we went below the green line. That was the sell signal. And then it was confirmed when we dropped below the red line. Our different charts, Heiken Ashi, negative. Keggy, negative, because it's red. Renko, negative with three solid red boxes. Three line break, negative. Point and figure added another zero. This is a double bottom breakdown. Sounds like a new craze for dancing. Trading systems, the elder system is negative for the S&P and the SPY. SAR continues to be negative with the dots on top. We're in deep purple land with the go, no go system. That's negative. Long-term charts, really showing ex extreme readings with the 50, 150, and even into the 200. Special K continues to decline. The diamonds are negative. And here is the Dow showing that we might be dropping down to S2 if we cannot find support near current levels. The Qs also are negative and they're also 
still above S2 support. Just to think out loud here, to me, what could be potentially happy, because we're just above S2 at a lot of these different levels, and S2 isn't that far away from the June low, if we could actually break down there, we might see critical mass from sentiment. We might see oversold conditions across the board. We might see this pattern of early weakness, late day buying, and that might end up giving us some kind of a bounce. I'm not predicting that. I'm just watching to see maybe if something like that will end up happening. The Vixen still looking kind of crazy here, but it is not spiking up either. In fact, it declined. In Thursday's session with the NASDAQ also still above this S2 level. Mid caps, they're almost down to the S2 level. Wilshire breaking support, and it's probably a little hard to see because of the volume bars. S2 is right down here where I have my cursor. Broad market, the dollar just continues to go up and up and up against the other currencies where we have a pretty strong inverse relationship between the S&P and the dollar index. Gold was down virtually unchanged, but down 0.06%, still in a negative trend overall. Silver was up 0.17%, but has been chopping sideways. Oil continues to decline down to 83.49. The correlation between the S&P and oil, they're having a tendency to go in the same direction. They're both going down. So that's why their correlation is quite high right now. Looking at bonds, they continue to fall as interest rates go up and our world bond index continues to show more weakness. Here's a chart I haven't shown in a while. We're seeing a breakout of the 10-year yield at 3.708%. This had been resistance before. We were able to come back down, but now we've been breaking out. Here's a 30-year look. See how we're really going up? We're at 3.65%. And this, this goes all the way back to the high set in 2007 to the low set in 2020. And we're almost up to the 61.8% retracement. Are we going to break through that and go higher? Will this act as resistance and will interest rates start to come down? That's what we're watching for. We don't know the answer to that right now. Stocks and bonds are both going down. So they still have a pretty strong correlated relationship. Our yield curves, the broken record here. 10 to the 5 is negative, 10 to the 2 is negative, 30 to the 5 is negative. The 10 to the 3 month is actually improving slightly and has not gone inverted. Tech to the 10 year is showing a pretty strong inverse relationship. As interest rates go up, tech is going down. And here just shows the overall trend of interest rates, even though we're seeing some continued weakness in the three month currently. Our scenarios actually were, well, let me get to that in just a second. The Coppic curve is actually starting to roll over as we continue to go down. Once we cross below this, we'll have to wait and see if a new signal is generated. We're getting to the point in some of these charts where some new signals might be generated. See how low we're getting with those S&P stocks above their 200-day simple moving average. And then with the 50, we're getting down extreme negative close to extreme negative with the mid caps, and we're getting down to extreme negative with the small caps. That could end up generating some new signals. We continue to see weakness with the 10-day average of the highs minus the lows, but not necessarily extreme yet. The broad picture of the highs minus the lows and then taking a five period simple moving average of that continues to show weakness. And we're not really spiking up all that much with the equity put call ratio based on five periods. We're still working off of this spike from a while back, but it really hasn't served us all that well as the market goes up a little bit and then right back down. Small caps, they were down over 2% and they're actually breaking below S1. Well, I guess it's a little hard to see here. We're almost down to S2 right now where the ratio between small caps and the S&P, small caps really underperformed. So this chart is just not helping us right now. The correlation between the S&P and the 10 year, pretty strongly negative, opposite directions. Sector rotation still showing some weakness. Discretionary, which had been holding up is now looking weaker. And our large cap growth to large cap value continues to underperform. 
And then large, mid, and small caps continue to show weakness as well. And then the correlation between the S&P and the two-year yield is pretty strongly inverse right now. The two years going up as the S&P is going down. And that just means the spike just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And then the utilities still tend to outperform or they, they don't tend to, they are outperforming the S&P. That's why we're seeing this line continue to decline. Staples, we're down 0.14%, holding up a little better. Yeah, we're starting to come back up, but we haven't taken out this spike yet. So what's our outlook? The technical technicals are negative and oversold. We have the preliminary September IHS market manufacturing. That's one report. And then the services report, both of those PMI readings are coming out on Friday. The whole list of geopolitical events, but inflation and interest rates are still the big concern for the market. We'll have to see if we get any kind of Fed speak. We still have to go with the down scenario, but we can't get overly excited about that because we are pretty strongly oversold, especially in the short term right now, and getting more that way in the intermediate term. We can't go with the up scenario right now because of that. We, we might get a little bit of a bounce from that, but the technicals and our scenarios are all really bad right now. And we can't really go sideways because ADX is above 20. So we just kind of have to watch and see, are we going to continue to fall? Are we going to go lower? Are we going to test the June lows? Are we going to get a bounce from here? Is it going to be more sideways action? We don't know the answer to those things. So our conclusion, the S&P is negative, short-term oversold, and also intermediate I'm, term. I'm saying that's oversold. Long-term, we're still negative. So thank you. Have a wonderful Friday. I will prepare the daily video for Monday's session over the weekend. So have a great weekend yourself, and I will talk to you in the next video.